good all right so finally we come to vinyana kanda the aggregate of consciousness now like the others this is described or talked about by the buddha in a very expansive way right yang kinchi vinyana ngatita nagarpachupanna whatever consciousness past present or future ajhatangwa bahidhawa internal or external hinangwa uh, panitangwa uh, inferior or superior larikawa sukamangwa coarse or fine yandure santikewa near or far sabbang vinyana all consciousness this is not me it's not mine it's not myself and when the buddha was talking about these things he was pretty emphatic uh, he wasn't messing around and he was clearly trying to not leave any wiggle room right because the self the ahankara right force in your mind which wants to make a self wants to keep a sense of identity that wants to live forever in the future right, is very very tricky that part of your mind is very very tricky and it always finds a way and it's always sneaking around behind your back and every time that you think you've let go of something it sneaks in and it says oh I'm the one who let go of that <laughs> And every time you find peace of mind, then Ahankara comes along and says, Oh, I'm the one who has peace of mind. And every time you have a good meditation, Ahankara comes along and says, Oh, I'm the one who has good meditation. And then you can walk along the street, like that guy driving his Mercedes through the poor suburbs. You can walk along the street and he's looking, I'm the one who has good meditation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Jhana is better than your jhana. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if anyone ever saw the um, the video clip by Arj Barker a number of years ago, the sickest Buddhist. You remember that? No one ever saw that. Didn't achieve the viral fame that it richly deserved. <laughs> uh, what does it say? I'm, I'm the sickest Buddhist. I don't know how why I'm just so Zen. I make the power of now look like the power of then. <laughs> <laughs> so when we when we look at our ideas of self and look at what we're attached to you know we look at the whole kind of spectrum of kinds of things that we've we've talked about today right it's a very broad spectrum right starting with simple things like the body and the material things we own and the feelings and perceptions and choices we're moving towards more and more subtle dimensions of our being and who we are and each one of those we can see actually it doesn't really last somehow it's not really satisfactory it's not really it doesn't really cut it at the end of the day and even if we look at all of the things that we can see and hear and think and taste and all of our memories and all of those ideas and all of those things we think no none of that is myself still this kind of feels like there's a self there somewhere kind of lurking in there and again, it comes back to that, that phrase of Yajna Valkya, the unseen seer, the unheard hearer, the unthought thinker, the unknown knower. Now, of course, for Yajna Valkya, being a Brahmanical philosopher, he was looking for an understanding of the Atman. He was looking to find a self. And Yajna Valkya's most uh, famous phrase, or he had many famous phrases actually, but one of the, one of the, the one of the phrases that he became very well known for was the words neti neti. Right. Yeah, do you know? Okay, <laughs> neti neti, not that, not that. And there's a very powerful dialogue that he had with his wife Maitreyi, 
and he was going to go forth. And this actually was quite an innovation within the Brahmanical tradition. The older Brahmanical tradition was very much a householder tradition. And they developed this kind of contemplative desire, and he was explaining why he was going forth. And he was talking to his wife, Maitre, and explaining why he was leaving. And he did that because he knew that she had the wisdom to be able to understand what he was doing. And he said that it's not for the sake of the, the, the wife, it's not for the sake of your property or your children or your sons or your fame or your wealth or any of those things that we can see outside. None of those are what matters. But it's for the sake of the self, for the sake of the Atman. This is what, this is what I'm going for, to seek what is the Atman. And where all of those things slip away, he described the Atman as the Vijnana Ganameva a sheer mass of consciousness. A sheer mass of consciousness. And that teaching, that teaching of the Atman as being that sheer mass of consciousness, I think, is the most powerful and profound and beautiful teaching that's ever been developed. Yeah? Until, of course, the Buddha came along and said, uh-uh. <laughs> But I think that we underestimate and we fail to appreciate what the Buddha was saying until we can really understand what these Brahmanical teachers were getting at. One of the things they talked about, one of the similes that they used, they said that, that in our, our lives, they said that are like the, they use the word Nama Rupa, names and forms. And the names and forms is more or less this kind of stuff that we're talking about here, right? All of the things we see in the world, all the things we identify with, all the specifics, all the particulars of the world, they're like the rivers. And when the rivers flow into the great ocean, that ocean is like the vinyana, that ocean of consciousness. And of course, Yajna Valkyrie's other famous saying, Tad Twangasi, and probably the most famous saying in all of Hindu philosophy, Tad Twangasi, thou art that. And when the Buddha talked about the self or the Atman, he used the exact inverse of that. Neso uh, hamasmi uh, is exactly the same words as tad twangasi, except turned upside down, and it's in first person rather than second person. Tad twangasi, thou art that. Neso hamasmi, I am not that. It's exactly the same words. So when the Buddha was coming along, he was answering directly to Yajnavalkya and to people like him. And the, the essence of the Upanishadic philosophy and the non-dual philosophy is that this self, this little self that you have in here, is really the divinity that is the consciousness of the universe, which is what we call Brahman. And that conscious divinity of the universe is eternal and lasts forever and is pure bliss. I mean, it's a, fant it's a fantastic philosophy. It's incredible that you could think this way. The way in the suttas this is expressed in the term so atta so loco, the self is the same as the cosmos. And so this to me is the depth and the profundity of the Buddha's teachings. When he left home to practice, he went and studied with the meditators who were practicing, it seems, in that Upanishadic tradition. Right? And you, you may be familiar with the story of the Buddha going forth and practicing under his meditation teachers. Is anyone not familiar with that story? Everyone's familiar with that story? No? We've got some head shaking? No? Okay, good, thank you. I'll, I'll just tell that story in brief. So the Buddha became disillusioned with life, went forth into the forest to meditate, and he thought, well, who shall I practice with? And he found a teacher called Alara Kalama who was one of the leading meditation teachers in India at the time. And he had an ashram, the Buddha went to stay with him. And this is all told in the, early, in the Majjhima Nikaya, in the early discourses. And Alara Kalama taught him, said, please come and teach and you can uh, uh, you know, join with the community here. And he said that he learnt, the, um, he learnt to memorize and recite the scriptures. All right? Now, it doesn't actually say what scriptures he was memorizing and reciting. However, the only <coughs> scriptures that we actually know existed in India at the time were the Vedic and Brahmanical scriptures. So it seems very likely that's what he was learning. Right? So these were probably 
orders of contemplatives who were in the tradition which was very similar to something like what Yajnavalkya was teaching. And having learned that teaching, he thought, well, this is not just about the theory, but there's also a practice to it. And so Alara Kalama said, yes, this is about a practice you can develop and realize this state of meditation. So he developed and practiced this very high state of meditation known as the realm of nothingness. And the Buddha, Buddha-to-be, practiced this, and he said to Alara Kalama, is this what you're talking about? And he said, yes, it is. And the Bodhisattva said, it's not good enough. Why? Because it still leads to rebirth. It still leads to something. It's still not complete letting go. It's just a very, very subtle state of consciousness. But there's still attachment in there. I've gone forth to let go of all attachment. I've gone forth to let go of everything. And this is still attaching to something. So remember what Yajnavalkya was saying, neti, neti, not that, not that. So he's let go of so many things. But still, this one thing, this very, very refined consciousness, he's still attaching to. So, Buddha rejected that. He went to another teacher, Odakarama Putta, who had a similar experience. He rejected both of those teachers, and then he went off into the forest to meditate and realize the truth for himself. Yes, please. But isn't there a concept of uh, moksha, which is kind of a little one in, in Hindu folk concepts? Mm, that is true, yeah. I mean, look, if we were to look at say, and say, you know, at, at the uh, Advaita teachings and things like that, I mean, there's so much in common yeah. between that and what the Buddha teaches, right? So, yes, you can, I'm not an expert in Advaita, so if somebody wants to tell me that really that concept is exactly the same, okay, that's fine, I <laughs> that's fine. But I'm just saying this is what it says in the Pali text, so this is the presentation that they're, they're giving there. So, but also not to forget that the Hindu tradition also didn't stay still, right? I mean, they were in dialogue with the Buddhists for hundreds of years and everyone was learning from each other, right? So, anyway, go on, yeah. And on that note, the Advaita system was developed after the rise of Buddhism. Right. So one historical theory is that Advaita Vedanta was heavily influenced by Buddhist philosophy. Right. Which is why there's some similarity. Yeah. And, and I mean, Advaita is primarily inspired by the early Upanishads, you know, Jamaica teaching. But yes, and I mean, Shankara was yes. called, accused of being a Gulhabaudha, a secret Buddhist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think both of them came from the same general area of Indian philosophy. Yeah. 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 You mean Shankara? Shankara and... Oh, maybe. No? I th- yeah, I think that's right. I think he was from the south. Yeah, Yajnavalkya was definitely from the same area. In fact, Yajnavalkya taught in some of the, taught in some of the same cities, uh, like Janakpur and, and places that the Buddha taught in. Janakpur is still exists. Uh, it's in um, Uttar Pradesh uh, and Mithila and some of those places. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is the thing, right? So this is why. This notion of vinyana is so very subtle. I talked before about, like, like we can consider like one 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 way of looking at it, or one way of kind of uh, unfolding or unpacking these these teachings is in terms of a develop, developmental process. And if we were to do that, if if sankara is the a mature adult who's able to make decisions, right? Then vinyana is perhaps you think of like is this the, the, a sage, mm. right? So Vinyana is somebody who has realized that there's more to life than being the owner and the controller and the decider mm. and who wants to develop their wisdom and their compassion and their consciousness, right? Much like you lot, right? And it seems like in, in human development, like these other ones are kind of n- normal, they're common, like it's expected that you will develop up to a point where you can make responsible decisions for yourself, right? Otherwise there's something wrong with you, yeah? But this one, vinyana, is not really expected, not in our culture, perhaps in ancient Indian culture it was, right? With the different stages of life that you go through and the later stages of life you go forth and, go and meditate. But in our culture, we don't, it's not really expected that you develop higher states of consciousness, right? It's becoming, you know, bit more understood and a bit more awareness of it but it's still only a few people right and those you know the people here 
have done some meditation. Most people will have done some meditation retreats and all of those things. And you know that it's not a, a simple or straightforward process. But then if we think about all of these other developmental processes, you know, developing perception, developing the ability to make rational decisions, it's also not a simple process. And it's not a process that we just kind of get when we're 18 and then we're fine with it, right? <laughs> You're actually still evolving and developing that through your life. Yeah? Or, or the other thing. Uh, <laughs> but hopefully you're evolving and developing that, right? So can't we, this is something that we can deliberately, intentionally develop uh, through meditation, where we're starting to get in touch with some of these more subtle forms of consciousness that the great sages were talking about. Now, how, so how that works in terms of meditation. Now, of course, these things are always present. Like, like these, are, these are part of the structure of how the mind works. Right? So we knew right now all of these things are working. Right? But when we meditate, think about what happens when we meditate. Right? So we're here now. Everything is around us. We can see, we can, we can hear things. I mean, this isn't a particularly stimulating environment by New York standards, I'm sure. <laughs> but it's still sight, sound, smell, taste and touch is, are still here. Right? So then when you go to meditate, some of that closes down, right? So usually you close your eyes, so maybe your, your visual stimulus is not there so much. You know, you're usually in a reasonably quiet space, so the sound goes down. Usually there's not much to smell or taste. So mostly when you're meditating, it comes back to like the physical feeling in your body. And then as you meditate, the meditation object becomes more and more clear, and you feel that physical feeling in your body starting to recede. And when you go into deeper meditation, you can find that that physical feeling will become very residual or will just disappear altogether. And then, but then the feelings also are becoming much more subtle. Yeah? So the feelings, the, normally we don't really notice it. Right? You're walking through the street, you see something you like this, you see something you don't like that. Ugh, no, and watching, maybe watching on your phone and Twitter and then it's like one second it's laughing at a meme, another one it's like, ugh, and then... It, it, and all these feelings come and go and you're not really aware of it. And you sit and meditate and you start to become aware of those feelings and they start to become more gentle, more subtle. They start to become more stretched out. Yeah? They start to be, last longer. Same with perceptions. Yeah? Becoming simpler. Everything's becoming simpler. Your mind is having to do less work. Right? Remember, perceptions to do with like... Uh, recognizing things, interpreting them, and so on. There's not so much to interpret, not so much work for the mind to do. It starts to rest. There's no decisions to make when you're meditating. So your mind sort of goes on thinking and stuff out of habit or whatever, but it doesn't actually have to. And all of those things settle and settle and settle. So the more you go into meditation and the deeper you go into meditation, all of these khandhas are becoming more refined. All of them are settling down. And so it's like a, a, a pool of water where all of the, the disturbances and all of the waves and all of the ripples starting to fade away and you can start to see the actual water itself and you can start to see the clarity of the water itself. And when you see that, it's almost shocking because you can, you can catch a glimpse of what, you, what, what you, the mind is. The mind that sits at the center of all of this. The mind that all of this revolves around. Everything revolves around it, but the mind just sits in the middle and watches the consciousness. And when you catch a glimpse of that consciousness, it's like so very soft so small it's like it's like it's the most tender soft thing that you can imagine and you see this mind and you realize all of the horrible things we do to it all of the ways that we mistreat our mind and yet actually in its essence the, the more subtle everything becomes, then the more powerful the mind becomes. 
and you realize that it's so powerful. Manopubhangama dhamma, the mind is the forerunner of all things. So the mind has this creative force and this creative power. And you look at all of the things that the mind has created and the mind has made up and how it works. And yet it's so gentle and so soft. And so in deep, when you go into deep meditation, you start to be able to catch a glimpse of this and be able to start to realize what the Buddha was talking about when he's talking about the mind. This, and this is the last bastion of the self. This is where the self has gone to hide. When everything else is gone. And so this is the, the uh, attachment that the meditator has to work through. Yeah? And one of the basic processes of meditation is that you will get attached to whatever experience you have in meditation. Normal. Every day, right? When, I, when I'm talking to somebody who's a, uh, you know, practicing meditation, I'll give you a hint, okay? <laughs> if somebody says, oh, blah, 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 I had this experience, blah, 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 I didn't get attached to it, I'm like, yeah, sure. Man. <laughs> <laughs> of course you got attached to it, right? It's okay. I talked about this with Ajahn Brahm years ago, and he said, look, sure, but it's better than getting attached to something really rubbish. <laughs> right? It's okay. It's natural you get attached to it. So it's not like a problem. So people talk about this sometimes. They say, oh, don't, if you have this you know, blissful state of meditation or something like that, you, know, you should have to be afraid of it. Right? This is what I was taught. I, I, oh, I, I had this beautiful meditation once. I felt so much bliss and so much joy. And I went into the talk to the teachers about it. And they said, oh, don't get attached. Be careful. Right? It's very bad teaching, I'm sorry. Very bad. The reason why you feel those things is because you're letting go. The reason why you feel happy in meditation is because you've let go of something. It's the attachment that's bringing your suffering. You let go and you feel joy. Why else would you feel joy? Nothing else is happening. <laughs> right? Where is the joy coming from? It's coming from somewhere. It's coming, it's coming because we have repressed and harmed and hurt our minds so much. And then when we stop doing that a little bit, the mind springs up. Thank you. <laughs> Like, like if you let an animal out of a cage and it jumps out into the yard and leaps around and says, oh, it's so amazing. It's freedom. That's the real meaning of freedom. And so the more that you let go, the more this buoyancy comes and the more this joy comes and the more you can see the clarity and the brilliance of the consciousness of the vijnana. And yes, you'll get attached to that. But don't worry. That's part of the process. You don't need to do anything at all. You just keep on practicing and you will gradually let go of those things. Your biggest problem at that point, right? Number one problem is becoming a guru. Because if you become a meditation teacher and if you think that you're enlightened or something, then it's really hard to get past that. Yeah? I've known some who have done this. I had a friend in, in Thailand, who was a Sri Lankan monk, and he, a uh, very, very lovely fellow, when he first ordained as a monk, um, he was like incredibly dedicated and he'd meditate like 14 hours a day. No, how many, how many hours a day? I think maybe, maybe 18 hours a day, I think it was. I think he'd meditate like three sessions, meditate three times a day, six hours each time. So just sit for six hours, have a bit of a break, sit for six hours and so on. And just did that for like a year or something crazy like this. And then he became an arahant. Yay! It makes it all worth it. Right? And he started up a, a meditation center and he started teaching people and he got all this following and all of these things. And then after he'd been doing that for a while, then he, because he had all these students, he thought to himself, well, I'm, I'm an arahant, but I don't have psychic powers, right? So it'd be nice if I could read people's minds and tell them how to meditate. So he thought, oh, so he found a teacher who he believed could teach him how to read minds and so on. I don't know if the teacher could read minds, but anyway, he knew what this guy's mind was about. And 
he managed to convince him that he wasn't really an arahant. He wasn't really fully enlightened. In fact, he wasn't a, a non-returner either, or a once-returner, or a stream enterer. <laughs> he was just a guy who had thought he was enlightened. Demoted, yeah. Demoted, yeah. It's kind of a crushing experience, right? And oh, you know, to me, it was really nice to see that because he came through it. And he was still practicing. And he's like, yes, well, this happened. And so he went, he went back to his meditation center and just told everybody, yes, no, I'm, I'm not enlightened, whatever. And <laughs> close, close the center, go home, find another teacher, and then he's going to go off and practice again. And that's how he ended up in Thailand. Yeah. And uh, interesting, right? And interesting how rare that is, right? Because the conceit comes in. And at that, that point, you know, like I said, you, you reach these states of meditation, yes, you get attached to them, and it's natural to get attached. It's also natural to let go of them. Right? It's natural to let go of that attachment because you're on that path of letting go. Right? But, but the problem is that at that point, your mind is incredibly powerful. And so if you let your conceit get hold of you, that conceit can become incredibly powerful as well. And that becomes something that's really hard to let go of. Yeah? So just something to bear in mind for yourselves and also for meditation teachers that you see around the place. Right? It's not up to us to judge who is enlightened and who isn't enlightened and who has this state of meditation, who does that. That's all a load of rubbish. Okay? what the Buddha was pointing to was about letting go. And if we're attaching and we're holding on, we're going to be suffering. And if we're letting go, suffering's going to come to an end. And that's what matters. So whatever teaching you're encountering, whatever tradition you're encountering, it's fine. But look into your mind. Are you letting go of what's unwholesome, developing what's wholesome? Are you becoming happier? Are you becoming more free? And if your spiritual development gets hijacked into guru worship and all of this cult kind of rubbish and all of these kinds of things, just be really careful of that yeah? because it's really easy to get hurt. And it's very rare to find a teacher like my friend who would just be able to let go of those things. Yeah? So when we're, when we're meditating, remember that, that for you to let go doesn't mean for you to give all of your ego to your teacher. Right. So for the Buddha, one of the definitions of someone who's a stream enterer, is the first stage of enlightenment, is that they are aparapachaya, not dependent on another. Right. Aparapachaya, first stage of enlightenment, you're not dependent on another. You've seen the truth for yourself. You don't need anybody to tell you what it is. And this is a really critical part of the Buddhist tradition that we have. Yes, we have our Kalyanamitta. We have our good friends, our spiritual friends to help us and support us. We have teachers and guides and all of those things, and that's great. But you have to know the truth for yourself. Don't let anybody take that away from you. And we were discussing this the other day, and actually even in the Vinaya, the code of conduct for the monks and nuns, there's actually rules and procedures in the Vinaya that instruct a student that they should disagree and disobey with their teacher under certain circumstances. Right? There's, no, there's no rule of obedience to a teacher. Right? But if the teacher's going astray, doing something wrong, then it's the student's duty to disobey them. It's the student's duty to try to put, get the teacher back in line. Yeah? So this is how we all can help and support each other along the path. Yeah? So this path through uh, understanding the five aggregates is a path in part which has a uh, like a conceptual aspect in terms of understanding what these things are it has a philosophical aspect in terms of like seeing how they relate to our ideas of the self and the soul and what survives us after death and these kinds of things it has a psychological aspect in that we can see it relates to like development of the mind and development of the person over time and it relates to things you can see in your mind and all of those things. So all of these things and many more are different aspects and dimensions of the teachings which we can draw out and see reflected in different ways. 
But at the end of the day, the important thing about the teaching of the five aggregates is that just as we're making the, the fist with the five aggregates, we're holding on to them, and that's the panchupadana kanda. We can also let go. That's the most important thing. And people think, when they're practicing, people think letting go is hard. Who thinks letting go is hard? Anyone thinks letting go is hard? You're all wrong. <laughs> You're wrong objectively and biologically. <laughs> Look at your hand. Look at your hand. Your hand has muscles for holding on. And your hand has muscles for letting go. Which muscles are strong? Which are the strong muscles on your hand? The muscles for holding on. These are the strong muscles. Why? Because holding on is hard. That's why you need the strong muscles. Letting go, it's easy. Hardly need anything at all. Yeah? Holding on is hard work. Attachment is hard work. Grasping is hard work. Letting go is easy. Yeah. We are all deluded, so we don't know that. Sorry? <laughs> yeah. We are all deluded, so we don't know that. Well, exactly, right? <laughs> and we, that's right. We keep on telling ourselves that we have to hold on, we have to attach, yeah. and that's the power of delusion, and it's what keeps us suffering. Yeah. Oh. Yes? The list that, that you were to think of the teaching of the Paul Kennedy very much, um, the list you're describing. Any of the bliss that you get in the spiritual path or any of the happiness you get in the spiritual path is always ultimately comes from letting go. And one of the things that the Buddha did was he talked in quite a lot of detail about like a psychology of pleasure. Uh, and the spiritual path, uh, I mean, the spiritual path obviously is not always accompanied by pleasure. I mean, obviously there are struggles and difficulties as well. But for the most part, when the Buddha was talking about meditation, he talked about in terms of pleasant feelings. And those pleasant feelings evolve from the more you know, straightforward feeling like we had today when we gave gifts to each other and we felt happy, all the way to the profound bliss of, of a deep jhana or a deep state of meditation. So it's not, the, the, these, are, these are all part of the joy of letting go and the joy of freedom. So you weren't talking about any specific category no. of joy? Yeah. yeah. So we have a, a, a few minutes before we finish. So, are there any, any? Would you like to have any last questions or thoughts before we before we go? Please. Mm. Uh, okay. <laughs> Can you speak then on uh, upadana and what is the opposite of pali? The letting go. Pali. The letting go. Oh, letting go. Well, um, pali is the usual word is muti, uh, which literally means to let go. Uh, and uh, so form, and me, there are many different forms of that used in Pali, which we translate as freedom or liberation or something like that. So vimutti or vimokka and so on. These are all different forms of that same word. So upadana is grasping, mutti is letting go. I heard upadana is also fueling. That's correct, yeah. That's right. So upadana also has this, this um, it's like the kind of dual meaning, uh, of like attaching to something, but also like fueling something, like fueling a fire. Yeah, I didn't go too much into that um, uh, today, but yeah, there's a whole sort of set of ideas and notions around that. But the primary idea is the idea of grasping, holding on to something. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, Bendy, for the wonderful teaching. Oh, so well, thank I you. That's very kind of you. <laughs> um, I have a question about the, uh, the first, the Vijnana, the consciousness. Vijnana. Vinyana. Vi nya na. Vinyana. Yeah, Mm. 
then the mind is very powerful. Mm. Then, uh, well, do you mean by by that point when you can see your mind that the mind is powerful? Mm. Okay. Um, well. Okay, so one of the things that you'll notice when you meditate, okay, so the, so the word we, English word we use to meditate is uh, represented by a number of Pali words, but one of the central Pali words, meaning meditation, is citta bhavana. Okay, citta bhavana. Citta meaning the mind or the heart, bhavana meaning to uh, expand or to grow, literally. So you could say it is the, uh, we can just translate it to bhavana as meditation, or you can expand, or you can translate it as the, the growth of the heart, or the expansion of the heart. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, you see, because our, our, our minds, or our hearts, or our consciousness, these are complicated things. And there's all kind of stuff in there, right? So I mean, if you if you have a a garden full of all kinds of plants and things like that, and you water it, well, all, all of those plants are going to grow, right? The weeds are going to grow as well as the other trees. That's why you have to sort of tend to the mind and and be careful of it and use your mindfulness and so on. But as you're developing that, uh, it doesn't necessarily go in one evenly, and doesn't necessarily go the way that you think it would go. It's growing and it's going in the right direction, but it's going a bit kind of it's a bit wobbly. And so as you go along, you find that sometimes the mind might go off in the wrong direction. Okay, so you may be sitting there very peacefully. Uh, this is something that happens a lot in metta meditation, for example, if you're doing loving kindness meditation, and then you try to do loving kindness, and you're like, beautiful, it's so wonderful, right? It's so nice. And you're doing so much metta, for so oh, it's wonderful. And then you come to the stage, you do loving kindness for a hated person. Right? Someone you really don't like. And you're like, oh, this is good. I feel good now. I've done, I, can, I can do this now. I can do it because I've got so much love in my heart. I can do metta for this, loved, for this hated person and it'll be fine. And you do it and it's great. And your mind is going down that path and I have so much love for that disliked person. And just this pure flowing of just wishing that person be happy and you feel so much joy and in your mind for that person. Pure, unadulterated, simple metta. Then, what sneaks into there is forgiveness. Oh, it's so nice. Forgiveness is such a beautiful thing. I'm doing metta. May they be happy, may they be happy. And may I forgive them for all the terrible things that they did. For this thing and that thing. And the other thing, <laughs> and I'm bloody thing that they did. <laughs> and before you know it, <laughs> your mind has slipped, and you this raging hate has come into your mind, right? And it's very powerful. And then you're like, ah, oh, start again, All right? Back to the beginning. <laughs> And so it can really be like that, and this is this is, and that that might be one aspect of it. another aspect. It's just not necessarily a negative way, but for example, uh, crossword puzzles. Hmm. She nods sagely. <laughs> right. So uh, my my friend in a friend in Sydney, Giles, and he taught meditation to his dad. Right. So he taught, teaches it to his old dad, and his dad was like. Fine, he'll learn some meditation from his son, and then, and then, you know, Giles says to his dad, you know, how's your meditation practice doing? And he said, oh, it's going great. He said, it really helps me to get the answers to the crossword puzzles. <laughs> and Giles like, sorry? He said, yeah, whenever I get stuck, I just sort of sit and meditate for five minutes, and the answer always comes to me. All right? And that's an exactly correct way to use meditation. Right? Because meditation, you're developing your mind. And that's exactly what the Buddha said. When you make your mind peaceful, you will see things as they really are. He wasn't exactly talking about crossword puzzles, <laughs> per se, but the same point remains. Right? 
that you're still seeing something. His mind had, was growing. Even just that little bit of meditation, his mind was more clear and the answer to the problem came to him. Now, he, he was only trying to deal with a very trivial problem. So he got a trivial answer. But the process is the same. The principle is the same. If you're dealing with a profound problem, then you develop meditation to a profound level and the answer will come to you. Yeah? This again, this is what it means by Chitta Bhavana. So this is how the mind is becoming more powerful as you go through this process. I mean, another, you know, so many examples of this, and sometimes we don't really notice it. I mean, even like a very, very basic level. Like when you're sitting to meditate and you feel an itch, right? And normally we don't even notice itches because there's so much stuff happening. You know, you maybe scratch it absent-mindedly or something, but you don't even pay attention to it. But you're meditating, and it's it's so annoying, right? Why? Because you're knowing it so more clearly. The power of your mindfulness and awareness has become more clear, which is why you're feeling that. So even though it registers as an annoyance, it's in fact a sign that your mind is already becoming more powerful. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's incredible though, isn't it? Because you're sitting to meditate and it's like it's, it's overwhelming desire to scratch this itch. It's like this huge thing. It's feeling right and you're like, dude, the world's, there's climate change and stuff. Like why? why? <laughs> it's like people dying of starvation and I'm like obsessed with this itch. <laughs> okay, yeah. Talking about feeling, we kind of identify feelings as like pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. Right. And I was wondering if it's only like the, like only perception that would distinguish a feeling as right. unpleasant. So like an itch is it only like my perception of itches that makes me right. Right, so yeah, perception and feeling are very closely related like that, yeah. So I mean I think that there is something definitely something to like a sort of primal sensation. Um, but yeah, it's, it certainly is wrapped up with perception a lot, right? Uh, and again, you know, you see this a lot with uh, even take something like say branding, right? And so you get like you know branding cigarettes or you know cheese or something like that. And if it comes in like a wrapper that says this is some famous brand, then you think, oh, this is so amazing. Uh, and it's just perception which is creating this. Yeah. By the way, I have to say now that we're on the topic, I have to say do have to say congratulations, America, for winning the World Cheese Championship. <laughs> Did you see that? Is that true? Yeah, America won the World Cheese Championship a couple of days ago. Yeah, first time ever. Yeah. yeah, make America great again. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I couldn't. I couldn't help it. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> it was a cheesy joke, anyway. <sighs> Sorry, yes, please. <laughs> yes. Um, in our um, second meditation, you, you, you told us to watch the right. sensation, the feeling. Yes. It changes. Yes. But uh, it changes. That's, uh, that is not the impermanence, right? Because impermanence is rise and fall. So this thing is like a, a line graph and right. impermanence is like a bar graph. And ah, well, in, yeah. in deep uh, meditation you some people may experience the, the falling away of right. things. Yeah. So uh, what is uh, may I have your comment? Sure, yeah. So you know we, the, what we're doing is just a sort of a very very introductory meditation just now so it's like I wouldn't say it's not impermanence but I'd say it's an aspect of impermanence uh, so when you're watching things watch the, the change of things is definitely an aspect of impermanence uh, but you're quite right that when you watch things at a more deep level you sort of watch them until they're gone yeah? and they're not there and so impermanent this is why impermanence is really challenging because it doesn't just mean it's there and it's a bit different but it means it'll be gone completely yeah so yes, thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you were talking the other night about something, and then mentioned something today. It reminded me, and I want to ask you about it. You were talking about how when you meditate, the mind can just become calm by itself. 
Right. What about when the mind just becomes cranky by itself? Like uh-huh. when you wake up on the wrong side of the bed, you know? And you talked about, um, you know, self-acceptance and that, and that's great. But... <laughs> 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 but... But, you know, anger is really bad, <laughs> right? It's all right. <laughs> it's okay. It was like you can kill one thing and it's anger you should kill. So sure. if you're brooding on anger for like a whole week, and let's just say you can't find any... Like, like you had a friend who was doing this. Yes. Like hypothetically. <laughs> I totally <laughs> this friend. She spent all of this week really angry mm-hmm. and irritable for yeah. no particular Well, they were lucky that they had you to help them out. I know, right? I'll pass this to <laughs> 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 um, like what is the, Like what are some practical things you can actually do? I mean, you're seeing, okay, this is anger, this is unwholesome. Okay, not fair enough. Well, look, one very helpful bit of advice for this, we mm-hmm. discussed the other day we were discussing about the Wisudi Maga, like there's the, the traditional Theravadan meditation manual, mm-hmm. translated as the path of purification, and it has very extensive uh, details and guidelines on how to do different kinds of meditation. And it's got a great section on metta meditation, and it's got a lot of details specifically on that point mm-hmm. of how to let go of anger. And... If you actually manage to read from the beginning to the end, you'll probably will have forgotten what it was you were angry about at the very first time. <laughs> <laughs> you might be, you might, you might be angry with the Sudi Maga instead, but at least it's more philosophical. Have you? Yeah, only the anger section, the whole. Right, but it's pretty good, right? It's very practical advice. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It's good. Yeah. I remember at that time actually I had a, a thing I was really angry about for right. several days. Right. And I wrote down a few little passages that I kept beside my bed and I would just read them. But it kind of gave me like a satisfaction. Okay. Like an angry satisfaction. Are they, right. What what gave you satisfaction? The, having the anger gave you satisfaction. No, it was like what is that passage? It's like uh, an angry person thinks they've won an argument and blah blah. Right. You know, I'm sorry. And you're like, yeah, no, I did win that exactly. argument. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm right. Well, I'm better. You know what I mean? Like, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I also know if I just wait, I can write it out. You know. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it will go. Right. And so the most the, the most important thing is to not fuel it. You know, not to not to keep it going, but it's hard, right? You want to go back and niggle at it and those kinds of things, but just 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 accept us. If if you if you recognise that it's that it's there, and you know that it's something you want to let go of, that's that's already most of the work. Most of the people are born, grow old, and die without even realising that. You've already done a huge amount of the work. And so the anger will go. You just have to be patient. And if you find yourself obsessing about it, you know, all of those instructions, you know, you can you just uh, uh, try to distract yourself. Think about something else. Try to surround yourself with happy things. Yeah? Uh, and, you know, go listen to some funny videos on YouTube. <laughs> it's more or less. Well, it says no city marker. <laughs> And uh, I mean, the thing is, a- 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 anger tends to burn, it, it tends to flame hot and burn itself out quite quickly. So, as long as you're not, f- the main, main thing is to not fuel it. It's difficult if you're in a situation where it keeps getting re provoked, like you're with someone who sort of, you know, pushes your buttons and gives you the triggers. And so, if that's the case, then sometimes you have to sort of learn sort of behavioral ways of managing it. Right, so how do you actually get yourself in a situation where, and that might be something as simple as like, say you have to go and see your boss and your boss is like really annoying. It might be something as simple as like, you know, just 10 deep breaths before you go into the boss's office, you know, at least get ready. Yeah. Might not be enough, but at least it's something. <laughs> yeah. So we're nearly at five o'clock, so we should probably uh, begin to just wrap up around about now. We're going to be having another session tomorrow on dependent origination. So that's going to be excellent.
<laughs> and <laughs> so uh, do you have a message before we finish or not? Yeah, okay, you can switch that off.